Welcome to Strategies for Recruiting, Training, and Retaining Healthcare Professionals on the Sun Coast. And a very special welcome to those who are joining us by MTV. We're glad you're part of this today as well. Sponsored by the Sun Coast Workforce Board's Committee for Healthcare Alliance and the Bi County Committee for Healthcare Cooperation, that is so evident here by what you're going to see today. What a great place for us to begin. Would you join me in welcoming the president of TRC Staffing Services and chairman of the Sun Coast Workforce Board, Dale Balruth? Dale. Well, I really want to welcome everybody here and thank you for coming. We feel like this is really an important day and uh, in the life of workforce and the, uh, the healthcare profession. And uh, your, your being here is really a reflection of how important the things are that we'll be addressing and, and we really can steer the future. Um, as you may well know, the Suncoast Workforce Board's mission really co coincides with what you're trying to do. We're, we're here to recruit and train and retain talent for the Sun Coast. And obviously your profession is a big part of that. And we're so pleased to be able to be involved in this today. Today we're gonna have a panel of experts and, uh, and also that you as uh, the rest as participants will get an opportunity to, to share ideas, to ask questions. So there's gonna be a lot of interaction. I think you're gonna find this a wonderful time. And again, I wanna personally thank you for the time here. And also I haven't introduced, I'd like to also introduce Mary Helen Crest. She's president and CEO of the Suncoast Workforce Board. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dale. And this indeed is a collaborative effort. And probably one thing that would be very helpful would be to get an overview of what's been going on and then what today will be about. She's already been introduced to you, but to do that for us, Dr. Vinsay, will you please? Thank you, Barry. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is really a celebration for the um, Bi-County Healthcare Committee and for the community. To give you a little bit of background, um, I had the pleasure of meeting Mary Helen Crest back in uh, August of 09 when I came to uh, Manatee County. Little did I know at that time she was writing a healthcare grant uh, with Leslie Loveless, her COO. Where's Leslie? Um, the grant was awarded to the Suncoast Workforce Board and it was to uh, address healthcare um, training and retention in the community. Uh, the committee was an ad hoc committee at the time. Uh, our mission has evolved uh, to provide strategic planning for training and employment issues related to the region's critical healthcare industry sector and facilitate regional discussion and cooperation. Well, what happened was um, Mary Helen and Leslie approached me and asked me to chair the committee. Uh, and I would have the pleasure of working with Runa Badal as my project manager, and everyone hopefully knows Runa, the lady in pink today. Well, we had the opportunity to bring all of our partners together in healthcare, both the education component and the healthcare provider component, uh, to the table. And in a minute, I'm going to recognize those individuals who've worked very hard. Uh, we started meeting in December of 2009. The grant officially ends next month. We have either uh, met or exceeded all of our deliverables. And these include uh, an, an original needs assessment that was done um, uh, for the community by um, professional design um, group, PDG. Uh, we also then um, started recruiting, training, and uh, placing uh, staff into the healthcare community. And then we also decided we needed to develop curricula to enhance the skills of existing staff, particularly in the areas of leadership and communication. We really all found out um, when, when all was said and done, and all the surveys were completed, all the interviews uh, had, been, had been done, that um, the technical skills are there in the workforce, but it's the people skills that need the attention. And so we really wanted to focus on how do we make sure at whatever level a healthcare provider we're dealing with, since they are interacting with the patient, with the clients, how do we make sure they have those abilities to communicate well and develop that trust uh, for patient compliance and, um, and respect, and obviously our, what we're here for is the um, outcomes uh, and better uh, health for the community. So um, doing that right now as we're finishing up, um, again, many of the partners participated in those trainings uh, for their staff, and uh, I also want to uh, recognize them very quickly at this time. So if you're here, please stand and um, hold your applause till the end, please, because we do have a very strong committee uh, and uh, 40 of us total. So um, with that, I'll start with uh, Manatee Healthcare System, uh, Cherie Thruitz and, and Deborah French, 
and from Blake Medical Center, Veronica LeCue, from Manatee Rural Health, Kelly Hodges, Manatee Glens, Deborah Kostrin, Pines of Sarasota, Joanne Westbrook, uh, Sarasota Memorial, Carrie Cousteau, Venice Regional Medical Center, Dana Wheeler and Serena Huggins, Sarasota County Health Department, Barbara O'Connor, uh, Tidewell Hospice, Philomena Desay, Village on the Isle, Elaine Boyer, uh, Doctors Hospital, Teresa Levering, um, Advanced Talent Solutions, Lisa Pierce, Dr. Murphy again from the Eye Center, Jackie Dazelski, Manatee Chamber of Commerce, Mary Murphy from Pinnacle Medical Group, Edna Apostle from Gulf Coast South AHEC, Maria Evie from Career Edge Funders Collaborative, Liz Gatlin from the Manatee County Medical Society, Larry Face from Next Level Achievement, Bonnie Hesselberg, State College of Florida, Priscilla Hafflick and Carolyn Ramsley, and Renee Hru from Manatee Technical Institute, Kathy Droder from Kaiser University, Scott Kennedy from Sarasota County Technical Institute, Linda DeMello from the University of South Florida, Jim Schreiber from SRS Professionals, Lou Galterio from the Suncoast Rio and Health Information Exchange, Kathy Durfee from um, Telk House, Mary Chilton from um, Manatee Economic Development Council, and not to forget the staff that were so influential in this, Pat Harborough from the Suncoast Workforce. She oversees the quality assurance and assisted us on the grant, and Fedora Ford Kendricks, who is the Director of Employability Services, who recruited our participants for the grant initiative. So thank you all. We are here to celebrate your work today. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Barry and uh, let you hear the details of our work. Thank you very much, Dr. Benzay. And it's true that this is an unusual collaborative effort. We both have the opportunity to work in many communities and cities throughout the state, and I was commenting to Mary Ellen as we began today, I can't recall, I'm not aware of another community that's had quite the level of cooperation we've had here. And it really takes collaboration for that to occur. And the collaborative partner is going to speak to that for a moment. He's the uh, vice president of the uh, Bi-County Community Foundation. He's an administrator with uh, much experience, not only in terms of health care, but community organizations, community relationships, and especially this partnership. So from Career Edge as well, would you please welcome Mark Pritchett. Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Helen, for letting us co-host this with you today. Uh, again, my name is Mark Pritchett. I'm with Gulf Coast Community Foundation. And uh, we're excited to be uh, representing Career Edge today. And is Jennifer Carp here, our staff person? There's Jennifer. We, you know, this has been a collaboration, but it's been a collaboration. A lot of collaborations sometimes don't result in anything, and this one really has. And one of the first collaborations we did was with the Suncoast Workforce Board at the time, now Suncoast, where we uh, identified four employers and we did a series of uh, training in healthcare that resulted in a whole, over 100 uh, healthcare employees being trained um, in clinical electronic records, health information technology, sexual assault, nurse examiners, and CHPN training. And we did that as we were sort of creating Career Edge. So it was one of these collaborations that was actually working before it, it really fulfilled its, uh, its mission in terms of planning. And now we're in our, uh, close to our first year in operation uh, the mission of Career Edge is to help low wage, low income families move into careers that are promising so their families will have sustaining wages. And Career Edge picked healthcare as the first industry sector to embark. And it happened at the same time the Bi County Healthcare Collaborative was meeting. So it worked out very well. And just to give you a couple of statistics, uh, we funded over 615 trainings that will result in 156 new jobs in healthcare. Uh, the wages associated that, the cumulative wages, will increase by $2.3 million for these families. And that's in our first year of operations. That's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> and you'll hear from the panelists, a lot of the, the, the uh, hospitals and uh, elder care facilities that we funded and how it was a great partnership with Suncoast. So, we're very excited about being here today and uh, hearing the results of the, the Pi County Healthcare uh, Commission or committee and also to pick another sector uh, to start working on. You know, we've got other sectors that are growing out there. Career Edge is moving into manufacturing. 
we have over 600 uh, manufacturing uh, trainings that we'll be doing probably in the next uh, few months. So the economy is starting to turn around. Good news. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And what a great example of how Career Edge and the Workforce Board together could spawn something that's reached the level we're at today. It would be helpful today if we considered this a summit. This is, this is not the end by any means. We've sort of reached a summit, and we're celebrating here in these first few moments the summit. But you're going to see very quickly the presentations will be over with, and our panel will be seated, and then we're going to have a continued community discussion. And that's what that's about this afternoon, is all of us in this room continuing this discussion and taking a few moments to be grateful for what's occurred and to celebrate that. But more importantly, where are we going? What's the next summit that's out there? I'm now going to introduce our participants. They're going to take their seats up front. We remove the tables you normally see. There is nothing between you and them. They are vulnerable. <laughs> and please hold your applause. Many of them have been introduced. You have a wonderful program that has the full biography of every participant. And it's truly amazing to have this many people able to give this kind of time on an afternoon like this, and we're very grateful for that. They're going to take their seats as I introduce them, and then when I complete that introduction, we'll show them our appreciation, and we'll be set to begin. The administrator of the Manatee County Health Department, Dr. Jennifer Bensay, is with us, and she'll be taking her seat. The Executive VP and Chief Organizational Development Officer for Tidal Hospice and Palliative Care, Philomona Disa. The CEO of Village on the Isle, Tom Kelly. Uh, attorney with Blaylock and Walters, and the author of a book that will be released soon called New Health Age, The Future of Healthcare in America, along with his partner, David Hull. Please welcome Jonathan Fleece. From the Suncoast Regional Health Information, the Managing Director and the original CEO, Lou Galterio. The Director and one of the important blueprint writers for healthcare professional education at the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee, Linda DeMello. And as you saw earlier on our video, the VP of Human Resources from Blake Medical Center, Veronica LeCou. Director of Medical, Surgical, and Division of Professional Education at Sarasota Memorial Hospital, Jean Marie Lucas. From the Manatee Chamber and the Manatee Healthcare Alliance, Jackie Dazelski. From the Sarasota County Technical Institute, Scott Kennedy. The Vice President for Medical Education at LECOM, the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, Dr. Chet Evans. The Provost of the Lakeland, Lakewood Ranch Campus for the State College of Florida, Dr. Bonnie Hesselberg. The Department Chair of Program Development for Kaiser University, Kathy Drotar. And a former Florida Teacher of the Year and now a consultant to the Manatee Technical Institute, Carolyn Ramsey. So please, will you show your appreciation to our panelists that are with us this afternoon. And I'm going to begin with Tom. Tom, I think you've got a great story to tell that's kind of an example of the collaboration. Tom, how did your employees get trained up in the electronic medical record system? There's a microphone right there, if you'll just take that. Go right ahead. It, they're all on. We leave them All on. right. The, um, the process we used, and um, this is kind of different, but we went and determined the different functions. For instance, the certified nursing assistants needed specific materials for tracking of activities of daily living, ADLs. The nurses had medical record needs. There was pharmacy needs and their therapy needs. And it just goes on. And dietary had its own special needs. So what happened in collaboration and uh, with the facility, management went to the employees. And we started with the CNAs, the people who give the bulk of the care in any health care facility. And on, with Elaine Boyer, the administrator and the director of nurses, and she sits as one of the people working on this, um, we found an organization that had a version of what we were trying to accomplish to show the staff. Well, the staff went down and they saw everything and were very enthused, and they were clamoring to move from paper and pencil into the electronic age. So what we did is instead of management all-knowing management making a decision on what kind of systems to use. We made a decision collaboratively, the management did, to find, to find systems for the different components that would seamlessly integrate with our operating system, which is Answers on Demand. So the long and the short of it is we found several vendors 
for each product and each component. And then the vendors had to come in and convince the hourly, the staff using the material, not management, but the staff used, that theirs was the best system. And by using that ground up approach, and by starting with the CNAs, all the other paraprofessionals and professionals then saw the benefits and they began to clamor for mm -hmm. the same kind of assistance. So they were the champions and what management did in finding the particular vendors, the only th we, always, we always made sure that no matter which one was chosen would work with our systems seamlessly and so it was a foolproof decision. And the only thing we never shared with anybody was the different prices. And the interesting thing was they chose always the most expensive technology. <laughs> but I, I want to just point this out. It wasn't a cost. It's an investment. Mm -hmm. Because training time, acceptance, retention of employees. We have people who would never go back anywhere else if they had to give up their technology. And then we found the Suncoast Work Board and Mark Pritchett from the Gulf Coast Community Foundation were willing to help front some of the costs for the uh, license training because that required more than we could do in-house <clears throat> without their help. And with that partnership in place, we've been operational now two years with electronic medical records. The system works seamlessly. It has an uptime of over 99% reliability. And we did our in we did our entire project for just under $150,000, and that's hardware, software, training, all in, uh, which isn't too shabby, folks. And keep in mind, we're going to have a networking time when we finish with refreshments, and you can corner Tom and find out more about how that happened. And if you have a question, one of our panelists is speaking, just raise your hand. We'll be happy to rec recognize you, and as well, to fill out your card. Philomena, at, at Tidewell, you've got multi-generational employees. And uh, every mic is owned, so you don't have to turn it on. They're all on, yes. Uh, you've got multi-generational employees there, and that's obviously an issue in any of our, many of our communities. Some places we have four and even five generations at work. How have you addressed that? Well, at Tidewell, we've got um, at least four cohorts um, from the, really, the veteran um, area to the uh, baby boomers down to the Jet X as well as the Millennium. And what we try to really do is educate not only the executive team, but we also made sure that we um, took the middle managers and helped them to understand the variety of different ways in which to not only communicate, but deal with conflict with the variety of different cohorts. And I think at this point in time, we're still doing some more work with that, and we will continue to do it because as new employees come in, not only do we have to learn to communicate amongst ourselves, but we also need to be able to communicate with a variety of different patients as well as caregivers that are out there. <clears throat> Each one deals with things very differently and they expect us to be able to provide end of life care in the most efficient, most compassionate way. However, if you've got a veteran being taken care of um, by someone who's a millennium generation, well, you know, you get somebody that comes in with a whole slew of perhaps tattoos or earrings and they speak a totally different language, they're sitting there texting away, well, one would not be able to understand exactly why that's happening. And so we try to make sure that we also provide information to our patients as well as to our caregivers. And how, what's the receptivity been among the, the millennials, the younger employees, to being more sensitive and going through the training? Have you had a Actually, positive? they've been very good. Um, you know, we find that most of our, um, especially CNA as well as our LPN and nursing um, group, we've been most successful with that, and the communication has been better. We continue to do that on an ongoing basis, and sometimes, you know, just in terms of communicating with them in terms of what they may not have done appropriately, well, one generation may want a text, whereas others want a face-to-face -face conversation. So each and, one is very different. And we're discovering that when you've got someone who is either a patient or a manager or a supervisor who's old enough to be your grandfather, that grandfathers and millennial grandchildren actually can get along. Yes. You, know, you know, you understand why, they have a common enemy, so they typically <laughs> are able to do that. Uh, Dr. Evans, uh, there's a shortage of physicians and nurses, at least we keep hearing that. Is that true, and how could that have happened? 
uh, in a place where there seems to be so much preparation for healthcare professionals? Well, I'll, I'll let Dr. Helselberg answer the nursing end of things, but I can talk to you a little bit about physicians as well as dentists. You know, the, you, there are nine dental, not, pardon me, there's nine medical schools in the state of Florida, and three new ones have been developed just within the last three years. And when those nine medical schools graduate their students in the year 2013, a unique thing is going to happen. There's going to be about 1,400 graduating doctors out there, but there's only about 7,200, I'm, I'm sorry, 720 entry-level residency positions. So about half of those doctors that we're training at the medical schools in the state will be eligible for residency training in the state. And unfortunately, the statistics show that the doctors will stay where they do their residency training, not where they go to medical school. And that's part of, part of the issue that, that's occurring. And, and the thing that's important to the health manpower issue is that every doctor that sets up practice in a particular area, on average, generates about $2.3 in economic impact in the local area, as well as 10 direct and indirect new jobs. So it's a critical issue. Florida has to find a way to in, expand the number of residency training programs for its medical graduates that come out. And um, half of those, again, about a medical student that graduates in the state of Florida has a 50% chance or less of getting a residency in the state. Yet 70% of them will practice where they do their residency. So we're actually a net exporter of physicians as a state. So when you think about dentistry, Florida has a rather dismal record on dentistry according to most of the stats. How does LECOM view that and how does your uh, new dental program respond to that? Well, that's kind of exciting for us. LEADCOM is a, is a truly mission-driven organization. You know, the main campus is based in Erie, Pennsylvania, and the whole purpose of the development of LEADCOM uh, relative to its osteopathic medical program was to fulfill that dearth of physicians nationwide as well as in Pennsylvania and Florida. The dental program, through a lot of research, we determined that Florida does a fairly poor job of addressing the dental needs, especially of its more disadvantaged citizens. And in fact, the recent Pew Health Commission report just came out awarding the grade of F to the state of Florida as being the last of 50 states in taking care of its citizens 18 and under. Now, you wouldn't think that when you look at Dade County or Palm Beach County, but the, the issue is Florida has, um, what do we have, 76 counties, 67 counties. And um, there are six of those counties that don't have a dentist in them at all. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's almost 10% of the counties in the state, one and two. We only have um, just under 900 dentists that participate in the Medicaid program. Florida also ranks amongst the top fifth in providing the lowest compensation to dentists for its Medicaid patients. So, you know, we have a conspiracy of events here that's causing some significant problems. And, you know, with all this new Medicaid legislation, it's going to be very curious to see how things turn out, especially for the oral health care needs of the citizens of Florida and the local area. Now, be prepared with your question. Dr. Hesselberg is going to respond to the nursing shortage and the nurses retiring. But the way this works, if you don't ask questions of the panelists, I get up there and they start asking you questions. And so we'll be <laughs> selecting you. So be thinking about what your question is. Dr. Hesselberg, we've heard a lot about the nursing shortage. We've heard a lot about nurses retiring. What's your perspective on that? Wow. <laughs> I think I'm a nurse that should retire. No. <laughs> um, the nursing shortage is real. Uh, maybe today with the economy, with the way it is right now, there are nurses that probably are not working the shifts that they want to work, which is nine to five and weekends off. However, the nursing shortage is real and it is going to get worse. And uh, with our 2010 Health Care Act, I want to kind of add on to what uh, um, Chet said here, particularly uh, for our ARNPs, our nurse practitioners, and not being able to practice to the full scope of their, um, of their learning. And one of the things that um, the Institute of Medicine report has come out with, with the future of nursing, which is a big report, made suggestions. And we in the state of Florida, and we are 50th, so dentists, you know, we're right there with you as far as nurse practitioners not being able to practice to the full scope of uh, their ability. So that's one of the things I think we need to uh, look at. And then be able to get that report also said that we need to double the number of uh, doctorates 
that we have so that these people can practice also to the full scope of their uh, uh, learning and become uh, faculty. We have a faculty shortage and we have to have at least a, a master's degree and we want uh, our schools uh, that are able to award master's degrees to uh, kind of beef that up. But again, the legislature, the money is not there, so we need more faculty, we need more institutions that can um, allow our students to do practice in their clinical sites, and that's always an issue. We have partners uh, from Hillsborough County all the way to Charlotte County as far as our associate degree and our baccalaureate degree that we partner with and we put our students there, but um, to get their uh, clinical training, but there's always a shortage of clinical space. And uh, so that's one of the big issues is clinical space, faculty, and of course then the aging population. So I don't uh, pretend to know the answers, but I know that it's real and we need to begin to really uh, lean on the legislature and funding is a big issue to get people back to school. It's not. Uh, it's not inexpensive to go back to school. And, you know, we really do appreciate our partnerships that we have here um, because they have helped us so greatly in uh, getting so many of our uh, citizens on that path to uh, becoming a professional nurse, starting maybe with that uh, certified nursing assistant, going on to one of our technical schools uh, for their licensed practical nurse, and then coming on to the State College of Florida for their associate degree and their baccalaureate degree in nursing, which I'm very proud to tell you, we've just graduated our first class of baccalaureate nursing. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that. Yes, uh, congratulations. <laughs> Dr. Helsenberg, this is a question. Here's a question from the audience for you and for Kathy, who's sitting right next to you. I'd like for both of you to answer this one. There's a desperate need for physical therapist assistance. SCF has a waiting list of 75 students. Kaiser doesn't have an opening until 2013. What can be done to increase these programs to more students? We need to hire. Would both of you address that question? Wow, that's a, that's a hard one. Uh, it's true, we're selecting right now 25 students out of a list of probably about 100. Uh, and again, much of the reason that uh, we can't uh, educate more is clinical space. It's not easy. Uh, one physical therapy site can take one student. When you've got 25 students, that's 25 sites. Uh, and not every site is going to take the, a student every single time. So mm -hmm. clinical space is a big issue, as well as finding qualified faculty to uh, teach those people. So yes, there is a shortage. It's much like uh, there is in, in many of our healthcare issues and our uh, it, occupations and we're trying to get another 25 out there so we'll see what Kathy has to say. And that's part of the advantage of you being here today. This collaborative effort allows all of us to hear this and have this discussion at the same time in real time and perhaps this will, will be part of the many initiatives that are a result of what's next. Kathy at Kaiser, how are you addressing this? Well, we've started a, a physical therapy assistant program. We've just taken in our second class. We take in a maximum of 24 students in each class. I think one of the things, and that's one of the great advantages of having this, uh, this communication and uh, the collaboration with all of our partners here, is that we are able to recognize that we do have these shortages and that we are all able to work on them and to, uh, you know, when you recognize there's a shortage, it's already there. And it takes time to bring people that are qualified into the area and to make sure that uh, you, that you're, you're providing not just, you're not just bringing up people that, uh, you know, can walk people up and down but that are trained and that are going to be able to work with those professionals that are out there. And again, there's uh, the accreditation that goes with a new program like that. Uh, we are uh, in that process with CAPT and they, uh, you do things on a basis that brings people in and that you are demonstrating that the product that you're turning out is uh, a good product and a quality product that the community can be proud of. That's very important. We have a question around here. Would you stand please? And just uh, tell us your name and then address your question. Oh, Ron Lucchino. The concern that we ha I have basically is I've been in the gerontology profession for about 30 years and I've taught at a university dealing with gerontology. We talk about prof professional shortages, PT, OT, nursing and so on. 
but very, very little do we talk about the geriatric nursing. We do talk about major shortages, but the major shortage really is in geriatric professionally trained healthcare professionals. And when we look at many of the curriculums, many schools have said, our curriculum is full. Geriatric is, is an area that we try to put in, but it's not really an area that's very, very heavily involved. And this also holds true in the medical schools. My concern is, is as you begin to look at the shortages and develop programs for the shortages, to, be, to ensure that you make sure that you include a very strong component in geriatrics in all of the, on all of the healthcare professions. So let's let anyone address that they would like to. Go ahead. Just briefly, from the perspective of USF Sarasota Manatee, some of you may be aware that we're moving towards what we consider to be the best of both worlds in that in June, we will complete a two and a half year project to become separately accredited as USF Sarasota Manatee, which will enable us um, to move forward to be even more responsive to the unique community's needs. At the same time, we will continue to develop our relationship and collaboration with the depth of expertise and resources of USF Tampa and especially USF Health. Uh, you'll see in, in the, my profile in the program, a uh, year ago I was asked to join the staff here to complete a study on the unique needs regarding healthcare professions requiring a baccalaureate and post-baccalaureate degree because that is USF's focus. And in response to your question, there are a couple of things that are happening. One is that I've been working with the College of Nursing in Tampa to broaden its presence here and education of students here in Sarasota Manatee. And this May and then following in September, we will begin two separate cohorts of BSN prepared students. But in addition to that, the overview that we heard um, and then as a lead into this identified shortages in nurse practitioners and doctorally prepared nurses. And we're prepared now with the College of Nursing to move forward in expanding the nurse practitioner program here locally. And to your point, the doctor, doctorate of nurse practitioner with a gerontology focus. So in the next four months, we will be finalizing plans to implement that. So we are um, very intentionally beginning to respond to that. There's so much more that needs to be done. In reality, we all could be doing the working to our capacity and there would still be more to be done. But USF Sarasota uh, Manatee is trying to be very strategic in leveraging our expertise and resources in very targeted areas. And then to end my comment um, in response to your question, there is a great deal that we need to do in leveraging the research that we already have in terms of effectiveness in dealing with older and elderly populations. And it's our intention to move forward with the leadership of Dr. Kathy Black and others, both on faculty here and in Tampa, in developing training and resources to help better prepare our practitioners at every level in dealing with the aging population. So thank you very much for that question. Very important question. Jean Maria, a question that sort of is a nexus to that. Healthcare degree requirements are changing. How do you see that impacting our discussion today? And then maybe if you'd like to address that even specifically to gerontology. Um, well, one of the things that we're seeing, you know, I'm most familiar with the acute care setting, but uh, our healthcare system is far reaching into the community and <clears throat> non-acute care. And, uh, you know, we are seeing um, a need for greater skill and expertise um, with our patients at the bedside. Um, as uh, Dr. Hesselberg referred to with the IOM report, um, the requirement, whoops, or the real need to have um, our bedside nurses in particular um, with um, higher level of education. I mean, we're looking at increasing um, BSN prepared nurses from 50% to 80%. <clears throat> That's substantial. And, and we really see that need at the bedside. We see, and in the community, that the, the skills that have been taught and gained in the past are, are not... Um, they need more beyond that. We're raising the bar. Our, our healthcare system is complex. 
Um, it's changing right before our eyes as we sit here now. And um, so the skill sets to be able to manage that, adapt, um, critically think, um, are really um, changing and uh, pushing us to raise the bar for our education. Not to mention that our patients are more complex. I mean, they're living longer, the technology is greater, and um, so the skills that were taught years ago are no longer sufficient to provide the level of quality and care that we're going to need. And, um, you know, we see that. Like um, Dr. Hesselberg said, um, doubling the doctoral prepared nurses, we need to be um, establishing more research in, in healthcare. Nurses ask good questions. Um, you know, we need them in education as faculty, but we also need them um, in the clinical settings as well. Um, that makes all the difference in how we take care of um, our community, our patients, our family members, um, one another. And the master's prepared level, we have um, currently less than 13 percent um, around the country are master's prepared nurses. And um, there, there's nothing wrong with raising the bar at that level. Um, the nice thing that we see is um, the career ladder, which, which has been really nice with this group, um, to take somebody from the CNA level or um, somebody from food and nutrition and give them the opportunity to um, work at the bedside, give them the CNA skills, and we watch them go back and get their LPN training. And, and, and those um, that get their LPN training, what we're finding is right before they're even finished with that, they're going back and getting their RN and their uh, bachelors, and, and, and then many of them their MSN, and we'd like to see them go even further and get their doctorate. So um, it's these kind of programs that will really make that difference. Another question from our audience. Your name, please. James Humphrey, and I'm with the Ross Camp Institute. My question to the panel, I've got two questions to the panel, actually. Um, myself and Dr. Evans were exploring the possibility, possibility of an MD-PhD program. No um, regional healthcare system can work really well without close ties to basic research. I'd like the panel to say how the county can improve that, or the counties. And the second question is on education. How can we involve more from the high school level up to encourage our future healthcare workers and researchers to get interested in science and medicine? And remember, this is a discussion today. I know we don't have a specific county representative sitting on the panel, but the opinions would be important of those that are here, and I know there's some that can speak to it. We'll, we'll do first. Wait, yeah, yes. I was just going to sort of uh, say something about research and getting the high schoolers interested in science. Uh, uh, State College of Florida has just received a national science grant to do just that type of thing and get some of our um, high school students that are very motivated into science and math and we know that that's an area that they need to uh, really get started in and research is absolutely one of the things that we all need to uh, begin to to do and do more of and and encourage our students at the very young age to ask the question why and many of them don't uh, I think today uh, Sarasota Memorial had a nice research day which was for the nurses, and you'll be surprised at the level of research that is going on uh, at the nursing level. But we just got to find a way to get that out into right. the uh, media. And I'd like to address just briefly the statement on geriatrics. Uh, we do know that there is a big need, obviously, in this county and, and across the nation. One of the things that we're doing at the State College of Florida, just for uh, just for information, I think we could probably all do more if we had more resources and more time and energy and effort. But um, with our baccalaureate programs that we've established. We've established one in Health Service Administration that will begin this fall. And there is a full concentration there of geriatrics. So, uh, and, and uh, we do have a component in our baccalaureate uh, program as well, just for geriatric nursing. But not nearly, I know, uh, as to what we need. And through our corporate and community development, we're looking at developing possibly a, an aging institute or something like that. So we, we know that there's more that needs to be done. And this, this type of forum and this committee, they can get it done. Scott, what's your perspective on this? Take the microphone right next to you. Um, well, um, Sarasota County School Board, uh, I can sort of address that. We built, we've got, we're in the process, uh, as many of you know, of we've just built a new SCTI. But right next door to us is Suncoast Polytech, which 
is a uh, 500 seat, sorry, 600 seat high school where all of the electives for the students are delivered at the Career and Technical Center. About 60 to 70 percent of those are all in science and health care. We have upwards uh, from all across Sarasota County about 600 students who attend SCTI and enter into the health care field. Um, anywhere, we, we, they begin with a CNA or a, a, a PCA, a patient care assistant, all, and we walk them all the way through the, the continuum straight on into LPN, and then they, and I can tell you that of those, about 80% of our graduates from our LPN program go on to SCF in their transition program. So we are addressing the needs in Sarasota County uh, for the um, high school science and also for health care. Um, as we progress in this area, you're going to see more and more students entering into health care. I think the largest problem we have, though, is the, they all, the unrealistic expectations. They all, it, they all think it's scrubs. And unfortunately, that's not what health care is. And, and as we move, as we start to indoctrinate them into health care, you know, there is a, a, a bit of an awakening period or a period where they realize, oh, I'm not going to fall in love with a doctor. <laughs> I really do have to do that. So, um, but we have a vested interest in the high school because they are the future. If you don't start with them, unfortunately, we can't, we, we're left with just the rest of us old folks up here. So. Carolyn, uh, both from MTI's perspective, but as a, as a former Florida Teacher of the Year, when you hear this notion about involving students younger, what's your response to that? Well, um, as you said, I'm here um, on behalf of MTI, but I do have some background at the high school level, and I can tell you, uh, um, based on what Scott has said, in Manatee County, we're doing some similar things at the high school through career and technical education we have a health science technology program that um, picks up students as early as the 10th grade and starts to um, cultivate that interest that they have in uh, or may have in um, a health science career. So there, there are lots of things going on uh, in that regard. And was there another question? Yeah, well, just in terms of MTI, that, that, that's an example of what you're doing to collaborate with that. And from a, from a teacher's standpoint, could there be more done uh, at the local school board level with teachers in general, maybe to help them see from a collaborative effort what these career opportunities are that they might identify sooner, that it wouldn't be left to the school counselor or to an external program? Do you think there's a way to engage teachers even more across the spectrum of different departments in the high, at the high school or middle school level? Well, absolutely, there's always uh, room for improvement, but I think um, some of the things that are going on in the high school are the collaboration uh, across disciplines with teachers and trying to cultivate the interest that students might have in uh, going into a health-related field. And don't forget to take a note. If you hear something during our network reception, you'll have a chance to speak with that person one-on-one. -on -one. Great questions. I, I'm spotted all of you. I'm coming to you. A quick follow-up question. Well, I'm encouraged to hear that m many of you are looking at gerontology and geriatrics. Well, would it be nice if somebody like Workforce or someone would pull all of the programs that are involved here, the academic programs that are involved here, pull them together and develop a skill set that would be common between all of them. And that would be very powerful for Florida, in this area of Florida, to saying we're putting out geriatric nurses and here's a skill set that we all agree upon. I think that's very, very critical. Next question right here, if you'll just stand up, please tell us your name and your question. My name is Kathy Black. Um, there are a lot of gerontological competencies in all of the professions that are out there. Um, I just got back from the American Society of Aging Conference in San Francisco last week, and um, the home care workforce in just a couple of years will surpass RNs and teachers. And you're talking about children and, and young people getting into careers. Um, we have a huge older adult population that's looking for work. And these people have a lot of the compassion and all the right skills, and perhaps um, one of the presentations I went to was the National Council on Aging with the Senior Employment uh, Act. Uh, their budget's being cut 45% this year, and these are people that were being uniquely placed with home care agencies. I think it's a market. Uh, the, the, the median age in uh, Sarasota for 2010 just went up to 54. So 50% of the population is 50 and older. These people are looking for work, living far longer than they thought, and capable of working. So I would, I, I would encourage you to look at older adults as well. Who would like to speak for just a moment to the question of the home care and, and, uh, and older adults? Yes, Scott, please um, do that. It's well known that um, career and technical ed, we do 
start with the formative stages for, of health care. And our CNA, or home health aid, um, I can tell you that across the board, our adult, pop, our adult classes we offer have um, long waiting lists be simply because of clinical space and of demand for the programs. Um, and the average age is over 50 for most of our programs. So that, that aside, I mean, there is, a, there is definitely a need, and we are trying to meet that need. But as Dr. Hesselberg alluded to, every program in healthcare requires clinical space. And every school here is going to Sarasota Memorial and saying, or Manatee Memorial or Blake and saying, I've got, a, I got 200 seats in nursing and I really need to put 200 nurses here. And unfortunately, that's five or six schools, you're now looking at 1,000 nurses and, and the hospitals are going, we'd really love to help you, but there aren't that many rooms, there aren't that many patients. So that's a problem and that's not something we can just fix. We all want to produce more. I think one of the things, though, that if we work together and do more and uh, with building the new simulation center that we've just done at the State College of Florida and using simulation to its fullest extent, and I know you have too at Sarasota Technical and I'm sure Manatee is, uh, that if we really begin to put our heads together and talk to people uh, that know how to do some of this and use simulation, that we can produce more. I have faith in this panel and in these two communities that come together collaboratively working together we will be able to come up with some good solutions. Dr. Murphy, what's your question? Uh, my question is to Mr. Fleece. Uh, <laughs> wake him up. Uh, the question would be that, you know, we have an issue and a dichotomy of the fact that we have, have all these older people and we're training all these people for gerontology nursing or, or to take care of them. We have Tidewell Hospice for the end of life issues. But we also have skilled nursing facilities, insisted uh, nursing facilities that have terrible problems because of, uh, of uh, lawsuits and financial troubles. And how are we going to be able to take care of these super, uh, uh, you know, aging folks and, and these baby, you know, these super seniors and, and when they need skilled nursing care? And, and can it, it can't all be done with home care, you know, and you're going to have to have facilities. And these facilities have real troubles. And you're a lawyer. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Good question, Dr. Dr. Murphy. Um, in fact, I've spent the last year, as, as Barry said, um, researching questions just like that for the book that um, David Houle and I, uh, futurists out of Chicago, have written, um, The New Health Age, uh, The Future of Healthcare in America. And one of the massive uh, changes that will be coming to healthcare in America over the next 10, 20 years will be integration. Um, and Basically, what integration looks like are all of the uh, entities and structures that you just mentioned, skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, home health care agencies, hospices, hospitals, physician groups, ancillary providers are going to be integrating. Why are they going to be integrating? They're going to be integrating to better coordinate the care that you just described. And what's going to drive that coordination? The payers. Um, Elderly uh, in America basically are, are being paid for by either Medicare or Medicaid. Um, so the payers in this case are going to drive uh, this massive integration. Uh, the entire structure of how healthcare is going to be paid for in America over the next 10 to 20 years is changing. Um, the payers are going to more bundled payments uh, as opposed to paying on a per diem or daily rate. They're going to pay bundled rates and they're basically being the payers are going to tell the providers, you all need to figure out how to divide up this money. That's what's driving integration. Uh, over the past year of my uh, legal career, probably 80% of what we've been working on is integration. It's already starting. Uh, medical groups merging, hospitals acquiring uh, physician practices. Um, I serve on the Tidewell Hospice Board. Um, they're looking at integration strategies. Everybody in, in the industry is integrating. And why are they doing it? To better coordinate that care so that you don't have silos of care anymore. You have integrated providers. And the key, which I know one of our panelists is going to talk about, to not just coordinating it, but is how to coordinate it. And technology is going to be one of those massive drivers of how to make sure that that care is better, is better coordinated. Um, just a quick example, and then I'll to another question, but um, there is now technology that uh, folks either in their home or in assisted living facilities can, can implement on their bodies that are constantly monitoring um, vital signs, temperature, uh, movement, mobility, so that instantaneously if you have a change 
um, in a patient's um, medical condition. You see an elevation in temperature, you see a reduction in, in mobility. That will electronically go to their medical home provider, their primary care provider, like a rural health or other uh, provider, and say, we've got a problem. So we can be preventative and send somebody into the assisted living facility or the skilled nursing facility before you get a major infection, before some awful um, uh, acute care um, situation arises, so you can be more preventative and bring the cost down. And, and Lynn, would you, would you speak to that, that IT issue? And also, while you're on that issue, <coughs> the great demand for IT workers in healthcare, but the length of time it takes to get prepared. And can someone really get started and get prepared and catch up with the software and the hardware? Speak to that whole dilemma for a moment, because Jonathan's introduces the notion that technology really is going to make a lot of collaboration happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, yeah, the, uh, the integration is the main piece. I've just lived this, actually, with my, my mother in New York and watching all the, the home care workers are one of the most advanced technologically I've ever seen going around taking care of their, their clientele. But um, yes, the, the technology um, is standardizing. And as it's standardizing, you could then have the, the ability to integrate. So it's not just an integration of the different technologies, but it's also an integration of the types of workers. So if you look at technology as the enabler um, it, it, and the empower, it, it will allow care to be given to the elderly. And it'll also, I think, I know for sure is a, 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 we're at the plateau of a new career. And I, I was listening to the, the question earlier about the young people coming, where are the jobs today? And, and you know, how do, are we addressing the high school people? Um, I have a marketing job to do, and it's really hard, because we have an intersection of two very technical fields here. We have the medical field, which is very specialized, and the technology field. And how do I get that message to the, the children in the high school to say, is this something you'd be interested in? So we've looked at intern programs, we looked at apprentice programs and what we're doing, and um, it's, it's a very fascinating time to be in this field. So uh, that, you know, the, the integration of technology to make it happen in, in, in the home, in the rural settings, in, um, uh, in the hospitals, uh, and how do you pay for it all? How do you integrate the payers? You could, well, I look at it as, architect, as an architecture. You have, you have something in the middle there, and all these other pieces are, will plug into that. And technology's the answer. Oh, and one last comment. There is a move, and some of the people may not have heard of this, but the idea of a team approach to medical care, as a, they call it a medical home, where you'll have a team with the, the patient, the doctor, uh, the hospital, and they address the care as a home, a medical team. And now that's getting brought up to the next level, which are called accountable care organizations. And it's, it's like a, a medical town. So I could talk more about that if, uh, if people want to. Philomena, thank you. Yeah, Philomena. Um, at Tidewell, one of the things we did, although we have um, CNA, uh, a, a care team that takes care of uh, many of our patients, we also implemented about two years ago the telehealth project. And that in itself, for um, patients with cardiac disease, for instance, it really has reduced um, hospitalization as well as ER visits. Just by monitoring their pulse, pulse ox, and um, weight, um, anyone in distress would normally, I mean, that's just human nature, um, call 911. What we try to do is with the physician who provides the parameters for us, we can give them a diuretic or within that time frame, and lo and behold, they really do feel much more comfortable, and hence um, we decrease um, ER and hospital visits. That, so that, that's important. Working for us. Yes. Real, real yes, please. One element that has not been touched on that I think is critical is you're going to have to get somehow get the regulators and the legislators up to speed because I can tell you as an operator, they don't get it. The regulatory people do not understand the application of technology and integration and the legislators definitely don't get it if you just look at the results of what the Florida legislature just did this last session. They well, don't get it. Well, Tom, I was standing here thinking that it's possible, it's possible that a lot of what we're talking about is being impacted by a city far removed from us. But Dr. Binsay has familiarity with this city. So hand her the microphone and she's going to, she's going to answer the question for us. What impact does the legislature have on this? As we're sitting here in a discussion, this is a front porch discussion. We're not voting or casting ballots. 
But as we're sitting here, what should we be aware of, of really the impact is, that's coming to us as a result of both the regulatory environment and the legislative environment? Well, I think talking or speaking on behalf of everyone up here, we're all affected one way or another by what the legislature has decided this year and, and others. And, and we know it's a very difficult time economically. Um, as a state employee, uh, I will tell you that um, uh, the Department of Health is very much uh, downsizing uh, as a result of House Bill 5311 last year. Uh, there was a great uh, interest by the uh, legislature to have us uh, do traditional public health services only uh, and develop really the model that we already have fortunately here in Manatee County where we have a federally qualified health center, Mr. Fusco's here representing them, doing the primary care. Uh, that may work here. Uh, it's going to take a while to work in Sarasota, for example, it, three to five years probably. There is really no major federally qualified health care system there. Uh, in the rural communities, the health department perhaps is the only provider in the community, uh, or there may be one hospital. So the ERs are going to be severely uh, affected by the numbers of persons going uh, there for, for primary care if there is no safety net. Um, but we continue to work together. Uh, actually, with Rural Health, we're doing a telemedicine project. We received a, a grant uh, through the LIP um, uh, low-income pool um, initiative, and so we're going to be starting telemedicine uh, in one of the um, uh, clinics out in um, Parrish. Uh, we're also trying to look at the dental situation. As Chet mentioned earlier, this is a tremendous problem, and oral health affects the whole body. Uh, and so while the Florida Department of Health has been cut, um, and primary care dollars include those um, dental dollars, uh, we're going to be working again with rural health to try to determine if we can even get in the schools, perhaps. The superintendent is very pro of our idea of doing sealants in the schools, at least starting some preventive measures uh, at the second-year-olds uh, or second graders uh, to try to, to reduce some of those uh, long-term problems later on. But there will be uh, layoffs across the state with you know, state employees, uh, particularly the nurses. Uh, the Florida Nursing Association has what's known as the bumping rights. So nurses will be moving around the state to uh, fill positions that uh, they have the uh, expertise in, uh, but it will very much shake up your, your teams and those um, who, who have positions one day and may not the next uh, in their agencies. Um, we're also uh, looking at um, morale issues. Uh, I think that the, the trainings that were discussed have been very useful, at least for the ones that, that um, I have who are specialists in their areas, epidemiologists, uh, health educators, uh, take, allowing them to participate in these trainings, giving them the skill set they need to feel confident that they, they have what is needed um, and, and uh, they can put it on their resume as well for their futures. Uh, that's been really important. Uh, but in, in also in addition to nurses, um, public health workforce is, is aging is just like all the others. But for us, specialists like environmental health technicians, uh, nutritionists, we have the Women, Infants, and uh, Children's Program. It's a federally, um, uh, uh, federal initiative uh, for nutrition for uh, children up to five pregnant women in the community. Uh, it brings in $5 million a year just to Manatee County. We can't find dietitians and, and uh, nutritionists to man these programs. So it's been really difficult uh, to see that um, uh, we have been poor uh, educators. I guess that's the base, best way to say it, poor marketers of who we are and what we do. And I think there's a tremendous need uh, in the healthcare arena to really showcase um, our value uh, from a preventive standpoint uh, as well as an acute care standpoint because, uh, as was said, um, there's some um, misperceptions right. um, that we're, we're currently dealing with now as a consequence. Jackie, at the Manatee Chamber Foundation, you conducted a study for health care needs. What were some of the implications of that study? Barry, um, a lot of the issues that have already been brought up today, back in the end of 2008, the Manatee Chamber Foundation released the findings, thanks to the partnership of Manatee County and USF, of the Manatee County Healthcare Study. And everything from communication amongst providers to communication to the general public about resources that are already available, but they just don't know where to find the information, um, the physician shortage, both recruitment and retention issue, um, financing indigent, indigent health, particularly in Manatee County, came up as, as big concerns through that health care study. Um, and so the chamber, as a business organization um, charged with ensuring quality of life in Manatee County and also ensuring economic development and the growth of the business base, we know that the quality of our health care system in Manatee County, Sarasota County as well, is going to be a big driver of economic development because what company is going to want to locate to our area if there isn't quality access and affordability within our health care system? 
Your name and your question, please. Yeah, thank you, panel. My name is Rick O'Connell. I'm with Mental Health Community Centers. And what I would like to know is what we are doing as a community to address the mental health care needs, uh, and uh, specifically with regard to uh, continuing education for general practitioners and the development of nurse practitioners in this field. So who among our panel would like to give us an answer to that question, your opinion on that? as it relates to mental health workers. Yes, take the microphone there. Just a real quick uh, answer to that on my part, the technology piece, is uh, we're very proud to be one of the uh, regional health information organizations that cater to uh, one of our focuses being behavioral. And we're working, uh, hopefully, uh, we have a number of members who are in the behavioral uh, field, and we're hoping to work with DCF and some of the areas that do as well. So we are addressing, uh, and some of the vendors, and there's not that many in that field, but, but your other questions I can't address. <laughs> so some of the educators, what, what, what's your first thought about that response? Well, as far as SCF and the nursing programs uh, when it comes to mental health, um, and probably all of our nursing programs, and I know of quite a few around, we could probably all do better. We do have uh, one rotation through the mental health uh, site uh, with our students and sort of expose them to that, uh, to that arena. And I know that our practical nurses get the same type of exposure. But as far as actually having a program that uh, would educate mental health technicians, we do not. But I do think that uh, that is something that is needed and has been something that we've been thinking about but haven't really gotten on the radar screen. I know Manatee Glens, if that's where you're from, that they do a fine, fine job, as does Sarasota Bay Care, uh, does a fine job. But uh, mental health care is uh, something I think that we all need to probably get on our radar screen as educators and as a, and as a community, um, as well as our aging population. Because uh, One of the things that's becoming apparent through our conversation today that there are some gaps that you're identifying right. that should indeed be part of the ongoing work of this. Jonathan. Um, before Bob's question, going back to that, one of the facts that um, David Hull and I uncovered in the research for this book is that if you look at the cost of care in America, um, it's basically chronic disease is, is the cause of most costs in America. 10% of chronic dis disease patients cost 70% of the spending. Of that 10%, Clinical depression is one of the top five chronic diseases that cost or contributes to that 70% of America's spending. So you do the math. If you just focus on that 10%, clinical depression being one, drop it by 1%, you've just gotten a seven-fold return on your money to bring down costs to then help a lot of these problems. So um, the future of healthcare is very much in the mental health, behavioral health spectrum. And as a community, we absolutely need to be focusing on that at, at all levels. Your name and your question. Uh, my name is Bob Goodman. Uh, before I give you my question, as the leaders of the community in healthcare, doing a wonderful job in, in building a system, you are missing the critical point. And my question is, what are you going to do we have a workforce that is not fit. We have an educational system of children uh, who is slowly going to deteriorate and will not be able to compete in the world economy. And if you do not switch some of your funding, because it's not going to come from Washington, it's not going to come from Tallahassee, we're going to have to do it here locally. So my question is, what are you going to do as the leaders of your businesses that it is in health care to bring about a fit community so that we don't have to invest to just take care of the sick because we just aren't going to be able to do it? Yes, Jackie. Just maybe part of an answer, and Dr. Bensey may have some additional information to add, um, knowing some of the grant funding that the health department has received. But, Bob, you couldn't be um, more uh, on target with your assessment that our entire community, the business community, our health care providers, um, need to step up to the plate and talk about wellness. Um, and the opportunity for prevention of cost, prevention of illness through wellness, whether that starts in our schools with children um, at a young age, or whether the businesses need to pick up uh, the, uh, the flag and carry that as well with our, with our workforce. And I think one of the priorities that's gonna emerge from the newly formed Manatee 
Healthcare Alliance is going to be finding that definition of wellness for our community. What are the benchmarks that we think our community is not yet meeting and needs to? And then as a community, as stakeholders in healthcare, as businesses, as families, as school systems, how we're going to meet those wellness benchmarks. Bob has one follow-up. Uh, just one follow-up. I am doing a considerable work in the state of Indiana, a very conservative state, and I can tell you that the healthcare community is 100% changing their way to build a fit community because they see major corporations who want to come to the state, the first thing they're looking for is a fit population that's gonna be the workforce. Yes, Jonathan? I, I can jump in with a model that, that, um, that I know is working in pockets of America that I think is coming to Manatee, Sarasota, and that will be explosive over the next 10 years. And, and Bob just, just hit on it. And I think, um, I do think the large employers in the community, the school boards, or the school districts, the counties, the, the hospital systems, uh, locally the FCCIs, uh, Bells, the large self-funded health plans, corporate America, I think will be the first leaders in this area because it's, they're self-funding their health care and they are seeing their premium costs go up anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 percent every year. The average employee in corporate America now costs $10,000 per year for health care. To stay competitive, as Bob said, as a, as, a, as a nation, we've got to bring down those costs. And it goes back to the point I made earlier about chronic disease. Whatever patient population you're dealing with, whether it's self-funded health plan, whether it's the elderly, whether it's the um, the, the underserved, 10% cost 70%. You go into a, a, a self-funded health plan and identify that 10%, whether it's obesity, which is causing uh, diabetes and heart disease, whatever the, the, the chronic condition is, focus on that population and you will bring down the cost. But it's got to be centered around um, wellness, prevention, behavioral change, and the only way to change it, according to the research, is, is incentives and motivating the employees to want to, to move in this direction to save those costs. Now, Veronica, as an employer, I'd like for you to address that. And then, mm -hmm. and then at the same time, I've got a follow-up question, but first, address that question as one of the largest employers in the county. Sure, uh, Bleak Medical Center is part of HCA, our parent company that employs 300,000 employees. Um, at Blake Medical, we have about 1,100, and we agree um, with the philosophical change that needs to happen. I, I couldn't echo uh, Jackie anymore either, and um, we have made a drastic change to our benefits plans effective this past January to refocus the dollars from what is uh, normally uh, the addressing, the, the reactive addressing of a, a chronic condition such as diabetes, which is a, a marked issue in our community, um, to a incentive plan where there are, uh, in this case, $500 allocated to staff who are going through health screenings and uh, seizing the smoking habits or uh, getting fit. Um, and they can use those dollars toward the payment of their um, premiums. So it pays to be fit. And uh, we believe that um, as a, a healthcare um, provider in the area, we need to set the example. And I feel like I, I, I share that with the rest of this committee. That's why we are here. That's why we're part of our, our bi-county healthcare committee and why we work with the Suncoast Workforce Board is because we believe in making an impact in the bi-county area. And if we stick together and become philosophically oriented to the prevention and not the reaction, we're gonna set the tone in our community. And that's what we need to show also to be more attractive to those incoming into our community. And as one of the largest employers, just on a tactical note, how does the Workforce Board help you fill those vacancies and train your associates? Um, goodness, both uh, the Suncoast Workforce Board through the um, Bi-County Health Committee, uh, also our partners at uh, uh, Career Edge uh, help us in very many ways, um, partnering with on-the-job training programs or placement of uh, displaced workers all the way to grants. And, and I'm very happy and proud to say that uh, we applied for recent grants. We obtained over $87,000 uh, from Career Edge uh, alone uh, to focus on our upcoming provisional trauma center level two designation, which is another um, item that is just essential to our 
counties, DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota. Um, and so we are phone, uh, funneling and focusing those dollars that these institutions are so gracefully uh, awarding to us to the training and development of staff who will be retained, uh, trained, uh, and recruited also from other areas into this uh, uh, Sun Coast area to uh, foster programs such as the Trauma Level 2 Center. Um, right now, um, and, and I'll have to go on my tangent, you stop me if you need to. Thank um, you for that response. <laughs> I was, no, I'm only teasing, go ahead, continue. Um, right now, most of you already know, we don't have a provisional trauma center uh, of any level in the Tri-County area, and uh, Blake Medical Center has been on a, a couple year project to make that happen. Uh, that's gonna bring physicians into the area, uh, creation of new jobs, we've already created over 10 of them, we'll continue to do so uh, in the future. Uh, dollars from different institutions for training and development, and what that's gonna create is uh, the ability for trauma victims in the area to visit a local facility, uh, for their families to visit them and also aid in the, uh, the recovery. Uh, and as we all know, we have that golden hour uh, that happens right after we engage in a trauma and um, being brought to receive expedited care is essential to that recovery uh, and to our rehabilitation as, as victims. And uh, I'm proud to say that Blake is uh, uh, hopefully soon going to receive that provisional trauma designation. And if it weren't for institutions like the Suncoast Workforce Board, by County Health Com Committee or, or Career Edge, we couldn't train and develop our workforce to be fit to, to, challenge, to meet those challenges. And we're 37 minutes away from our networking time, so you want to be sure you're thinking about that. And we're getting great questions from the audience. I've got a lot of cards we'll get to in a moment, but your name and your question. Uh, Hedda Matza Houghton, and my question is, wellness and prevention are really key, as you discussed. Um, and, but the issue always is the funding for that component. Because it's always, if you don't have, you know, if it's not funded somehow through some way, that's the piece that always is difficult. Because we, those of us that are in prevention and wellness, always struggle with how do we get more of those kind of programs accessible to our, to our population out in the community. Yes, I, go ahead. I can jump in. I mean, I think you just said it best. Uh, employers are starting to realize they will pay for wellness and prevention programs, $500 per employee to then, in the long term, bring down the cost. So you're gonna start seeing it more and more through these self-funded plans like HCA has um, and other self-funded plans. On the, on the public payer side, you're also seeing more coming down the pike um, in that regard. For the first time in Medicare's history, um, Medicare now pays for an annual physical. That started under, under PPACA um, starting January 1. And then you're seeing tremendous amount of wellness um, prevention programs coming out of the community health centers like Rural Health, where you're seeing state um, reimbursement mechanisms that Dr. Benson target that prevention and wellness, wellness factor. Um, it may actually cost more money in the short term, and that's what I think we as Americans and, and as a community need to realize, just like when we built the interstate system, it took money to build it, but once you had that stream of, of commerce, look at the, the, the decades um, of, of payback, but it, it is coming. Now please continue to prepare your questions. We will get to every question before five o'clock. And if we have to do a lightning round, we'll do that. But be sure you keep preparing your questions. This is very important. Now, Dr. Evans, here's a dental question that I, th I think has some significance. Uh, I wrote my question down, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. My, Robin DeSabatino, my husband's a retired periodontist, and when we moved to the state of Florida, he elected not to practice again because he needs to take a separate dental board. And I believe Florida is only one of three or four states that requires a separate dental board, unlike medical. So here you're telling me you have a shortage of dentists in the state. Is there anything being done to change this rule? Well, I, I, let me qualify my statement um, and to say I'm a podiatric physician by training and Florida often shoots itself in the foot. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, the, the mentality of a lot of the health professions years ago, and I, again, this is anecdotal, was Florida's a great place, but let's keep a lot of people out. We want to be very exclusive with who practices in the state of Florida. And I can really truly, I sit on the state board as well. So, you know, now it's a little bit different. In fact, some legislation through Senator Peden when he was, was uh, in, the, in the House, up in, actually in the Senate in Tallahassee, 
was to promote uh, dentists that were coming from other states that were in a retired, if they, if they worked in a, um, in a needy area or a health profession, dental health profession shortage area, they could get temporary licenses. And in fact, that program exists, and right now there are about a dozen dentists who have that special license to practice in needy areas or in you know, specified uh, areas, to, and, and they can do that in dentistry. But, you know, it's an issue of distribution. It's where people want to live. It's, um, it's not just a shortage issue. It's the Medicaid reimbursement. It, we're the bottom five in just about every Medicaid area, but in dental, in the prov provision of uh, funding for dental services, where nobody wants to be a dentist to take care of that population. So, you know, the, the, there's a series of events that have conspired to make this a major issue. And so, we just need to address it. And, and the everyone's here talking, one of the major factors we're talking about is timeliness. Well, you gotta think about this. It takes four years to get a dentist out there. It takes four years to get a nurse. It takes six years to get a nurse practitioner. Eight years to get a doctorate in nursing. It takes uh, to get a physician out there. That's seven to 10 to 12 years, depending on the physician. So we're not talking about these issues soon enough, quite frankly. And again, it's also this issue of wellness and health. The, the, the medical community, for many years, we were geared to take care of acute sicknesses. We weren't concerned with wellness and prevention. And so you have to get the philosophy and you have to get the educational approach of all the healthcare professions towards prevention and wellness. And that's starting to happen, but the dollars are gonna drive it, corporate America is gonna drive it, they see the benefit to it, and it's going to happen, so. Um, and here's a, here's a follow-up. Well, in dentistry, you have a huge already trained workforce that are seasoned veterans in the field mm -hmm. that are either specialists or generalists. But if a specialist comes down here and even wants to take the board again, they've been trained to specialize in periodontics or orthodontics. They are not allowed in, in their former states to practice general. Yet on a board, they would have to do a filling and they would have to do everything for right. a general dentist. But here you already have a trained workforce. So if there's something that you can do to, uh, again, with legislation, to uh, make it a little bit easier to have these dentists work again. Maybe that population, if since they're semi-retired or retired, would want to take on some of the patients because they, you know they have their their nest egg and they would do it just to keep their their hands busy. So well, to we're going to look for Something those folks to volunteer at Lee yeah. Combs New Dental School. Yeah. I can show you that right now. But secondly, if they if they're willing to go to one of the 34 rural counties of the state of Florida, and if they'll practice in, in a specified area, um, to those folks that need to have dental care, they can get that license. And I, 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 I absolutely, I cannot tell you what the legislation is, but it exists now. And there are at least a dozen dentists now that have that specialized licensure that are just like your husband, that are retired, that are down here, that want to practice and give. So there is an opportunity. May I ask you a question? Yes, From a county commission perspective, as you're hearing all these comments, what are you thinking? Uh, about in general? About, about what uh, you're hearing. Oh, it's great. I uh, really applaud you all for doing such a great job and being hands-on in the community and uh, admitting that we have some shortcomings in going forward because things are changing as we see things are changing before our very eyes regarding uh, health care. And uh, thank you all very much for your efforts. Does it give you any thoughts about maybe a closer partnership between county government and both we have private and obviously other public sectors and part of county government represented here? As you hear this kind of conversation, does it, does it generate in you any thoughts about how we might need to strengthen that partnership, if at all? Yes, we're all promoting uh, the public-private partnerships, the three Ps, and I've been working very uh, closely with uh, Dr. Bensi regarding the, the children and after school on, on Wednesday. So we're trying to work with that. So uh, I'm very hands-on in this field. Good. Thank Good. you. Thank you for being here. With that. Scott, a question to you. When someone wants to move into a healthcare career field, how important is pre-screening? Do you think that is important, or do we just open the door wide for this? I think that's a huge area in which we need to expand. Unfortunately, a lot of people believe that they want to just, you know, you, it's one thing to want to be a nurse, it's another thing to make a career change to become a nurse. I think you have to, a little bit of pre-screening ahead of time, there are certain things that the Board of Nursing looks for in your background without going into it that will disallow you from it. And I think, unfortunately, we spend a lot of time counseling uh, clients and directing them towards health care, only to find out afterwards that, you know, I'll use an example of a fireman. Um, you um, I had a, a young man who wanted to become a fireman. Well, he was, he was also an arsonist. 
the fire department is, in, they, you know, the, fire, the board is not going to allow an arsonist to become a fireman. They're not going to allow a felon to become a nurse in certain cases. So I think pre-screening the applicants, because that's an opportunity. You have a, a, um, a, a sort of a captive audience where you can say, you know what, that might not be for you, but there is this. And while you have them in your office or have them in the office, you can direct them towards something that may not be exactly what they came for, but ultimately will result in a job. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're here for, is to get them educated and get them a job. Jane Marie, when you think about employees even making the decision to go back to school and sort of self-screening themselves, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, one of the, um, you know, we really try to advocate with our employees to, um, and Carrie Cousteau sitting back there, and, and um, she's our professional development person. And, and it, we're very fortunate as an organization to have somebody like that who can encourage our employees to come and basically counsel them and advocate to assist them to go back to school. And, and you know, working collaboratively with this group, we have tremendous resources. Um, where some of the challenges lie is, um, you know, this, these have been tough times for people um, financially. And I would say that's one of the greatest barriers is, um, you know, employees' um, time away from work. A lot of people are sole providers for their families now, and because uh, their spouse is out of work or there isn't a significant other, they're raising children, their grandparents who are who are raising children, and um, so time away from work is very challenging. Um, they really don't have the upfront costs of um, trying to go back to school. This has afforded us um, um, the luxury of um, getting giving those people that head start. Um, it, there are also non-tangible things such as, um, you know, the support, the support from the organization to to give them flexible schedules and ensuring that they have the emotional support um, from family and peers. Um, and I just wanted to add one other thing, and we've talked a lot, um, kind of not related to what I just said, but we've talked a lot about, um, you know, the clinical aspects of healthcare and taking care of patients. And I think one of the things that will be as critical to the clinical needs um, is, um, is providing um, a strong workforce in leadership in healthcare. And um, it's sort of my passion, um, but this is something that I think we've all recognized and um, look for opportunities to develop and pro provide education and training for those individuals who either, and from the high school level, um, getting into healthcare um, and, and getting education and training and become well-versed in leadership um, health systems management to integrate all of these things that we talked about, um, as well as health policy issues. So, um, and we, we've been able to work collaboratively a little bit, but there's a lot more room for improvement on that front. But, but you're doing an awful lot of collaboration. I, I, in my firm, we actually provide a lot of leadership training to major healthcare facilities, large healthcare, large hospital groups. And sometimes the lack of collaboration is what really hurts mm -hmm. because they're not collaborating across everyone that's in their immediate community. It makes a real difference. Uh, Jackie, you wanted to comment on that, I think, on the previous About comment. collaboration, yes. and I think, although germane to today's topic is the collaboration on the workforce issue of healthcare, but um, the Manatee Healthcare Alliance is getting ready to kick off um, as an organization, and we have uh, 25 organizations uh, across all aspects of healthcare that have already signed on to become a founding member, and it's that communication and collaboration that's key. Whether it's the workforce issues we're talking about today with healthcare, whether it's the advocacy, trying to bring about legislative reform when it, um, it, it requires collaboration, whether we're talking um, about uh, health information exchanges and educating not only providers, but also the community as a whole as to what the benefits are. Politics aside, we have a huge challenge in educating the community about what federal health care reform really means, um, because a lot of it's coming, whether there's changes coming or not at the legislative level, um, a lot of that's going to be implemented regardless. So collaboration and communication are key to pretty much everything. Now, Kathy, as you heard the discussion about some of the pre-screening and some of the challenges that mature students face, why do students choose Kaiser? Well, one of the reasons is because uh, we have a student first philosophy and that we have those flexible schedules that uh, the students that most, the majority of our students uh, are older, they've had the families or they're in jobs and that we're able to provide that a lot of our programs, we're, we're not just about medical, uh, we've got those technology programs and, and others, uh, as do many of the other uh, 
educational programs here, but um, when it comes to pre-screening, uh, that you, there is some that's needed because uh, you know I went to a, a health career uh, a health care fair and um, at Northport High School, and uh, I was there in my scrubs, and they wanted, and I said, oh, what are you going to do? I'm going to be a neurosurgeon, and, you know, so some of their goals might not be realistic, and I think with the counseling, the admissions counseling that they get when they first come to Kaiser University helps them to realize maybe where they might want to be, and that the programs that are there, uh, because we're private, we can enforce more things like uh, personal responsibility and accountability and get some of those, um, some of those soft skills and the leadership that, that are needed because my students are radiologic technologists. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of people to make up the healthcare community. And by helping them to uh, maybe redirect them while they're in programs that something that might work better for them is also there. So, uh, you know, getting that involvement. And I would also add in that it's not just high school students. We have uh, a career counselor who goes out to different high schools and, and hosts different functions. And um, this Saturday we have a carnival going for those, uh, for those individuals. But People, by the time they get to high school, a lot of them have already made up their minds or have some kind of a direction. And I really think we need to be looking at, mm. you know, seventh, eighth grade students. We have two questions that I'd like to pose to both the educators and the healthcare employers that are here because they're related. So I'll ask both questions and then you can choose who would like to answer those. And it's germane to what you just said. Here's the first one. Master's level physical therapist, occupational therapist, and speech language pathologist are difficult to recruit. And often we hire out of state candidates. What is available to help train these students here? Now here's the adjacent question. To what degree are the educational institutions, USF, Kaiser, LeeCom, et cetera, building specific student enrollment goals by curriculum in alignment with specific headcount job description of area opportunities to ensure the graduates truly have jobs waiting for them locally so that their funds are a good investment and we don't lose the talent where they go somewhere else? So let me take the first um, part of that in terms of USF moving forward with a very specific high need area, and that is physical, uh, pardon me, uh, speech and language pathology. We've had a concentration here of courses in that field, but beginning this fall, given the separate accreditation, we're gonna be moving forward with a second bachelor's degree in speech and language pathology, and it will be available online then my hope is, and based on the recommendation of my study, that within two years, we'll implement the masters in speech and language pathology. There is such a shortfall of qualified workers that school districts are employing, and other employers are employing um, graduates with a bachelor's degree on the contingency that within a certain period of time they will pursue the required master's degree. So we hope very quickly, as of this fall, to provide the opportunity for people to get the second bachelor's degree, become practicing speech and language pathologists with certain oversight, and then move very quickly into the master's program. That's a direct outgrowth of the study, determining the need, the workforce opportunities for employment, and then creating the two-step process of qualifying people. Yes, and one of our other educators want to respond to that? Yep. Either one? Talk. Well, I, I just want to address the, the um, medical end of things. Uh, we work, we, because we know that physicians will stay in the area where they do their residency training program, we've been working with Manatee Memorial Hospital, and they, they have, through the most recent resident match, um, we have worked with them to, to develop 24 primary care residency training slots that will be, um, and they begin with eight entry levels, so it's eight, eight, eight in family medicine and internal medicine. So we know that those doctors, at least 70% of the, those doctors, we can expect now that train here at Manatee Memorial will stay locally, provide that economic impact that I spoke of, and at least mm -hmm. 10 jobs per physician at stake. So, so we knew we needed not just to increase the number of medical students, but we knew that we needed to do something about the postgraduate training. And Manatee saw that as a win-win for um, their hospital, but also for Manatee County in that regard. And that's a, you know, that, that's a natural cooperative thing that can occur relative to, but you have to identify what the issue is. We mm -hmm. know there's a shortage of physicians. Relative to dental care, we hope to have 
a uh, distributed uh, dental education model in the fourth year where the dental students are all out in community health centers and rural health sites because we know that that's where the need is for dental providers and we, I would assume that's the direction that the dental assistant training program, dental hygiene and doing, uh, they're looking to the areas that need to place their students there with the expectation that some of those students will certainly choose to practice and stay in that area. Kathy, go ahead. Um, at Kaiser University, one of the things that, that uh, the Kaiser family has been working towards for 35 years is becoming a not-for-profit private institution, which we now are. We've changed that focus because we now have uh, not only bachelor's but master's and doctoral programs. And some of the occupations that you talked about are a small segment of, they're the smaller segment, and I think that's why they tend to get uh, not all of the attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you talk about nurses and doctors, they're the larger part. Uh, that I know that the American Society of Radiologic Technologists says that uh, by 2014 we're going to need another 100,000 radiologic technologists in the workforce. Um, but I think what we're seeing with OTA and PTA is that what's going to happen, it's going to be that integration that we're talking about because uh, right now Kaiser is, I don't see us having those master level programs, but they're in existence. But we can train them at the, you know, they can start at MTI, they can be a CNA, they can then go into uh, those other, and as they work their way up, because who is paying for their education, and a large part of that is going to come out of their pocket. Here's a question, oh, Dr. Vincent, go ahead. Can I just quickly follow up? Um, I think this group has set the stage for that. I think the SANE training was a perfect example. We knew we needed that sexual assault nursing training in the community, and we made it happen uh, with three hospitals collaborating. I think with the Healthcare Alliance now, one of the committees actually is workforce development, so perhaps they can take on that task of really aligning um, needs and uh, training opportunities in the community. So as Jackie said, they'll be uh, meeting next week and, and uh, starting their committee work. So, so here's I a technology just, question, quickly. I was just gonna add to that very quickly that at the State College of Florida, as you know, we're offering um, our workforce degrees right. in the Baccalaureate of Applied Science. And so we're planning on putting out about 12 more of those. So I just say watch for those. But I wanted to echo that with partnerships that we've been able to uh, do with Florida State and some of our other colleges, to be able to offer the master's in nursing here locally as well as the doctorate in nursing practice. And if we continue on that type of uh, pathway, then we'll partner with other people and other schools that offer those other graduate degrees. Because as Chet said, it takes a long time. You know, right. you don't get there overnight. So that's right. We can't be one school can't be all things to everybody. But if we collaborate and partner together, we we can make it happen. Now, Lou, here's a technology question, and anyone can respond to this as well. And this is one of those in, I think really insightful, intriguing, maybe smaller questions that could have much larger impact. As we progress to become a leading region in healthcare, what ideas do the local healthcare providers, and I would add, and/or institutions? have to brainstorm or partner with local entrepreneurs for medical device technology or data, data based outcomes analysis for a host of things that are technological, not clinical necessarily, rather than, you know, heaven forbid, going to Tampa uh, to find somebody to partner with. You know, it's a, little bit of, it's a little bit of the reverse of not in my backyard, I suppose, but there are communities around the country where they've said, you know, when we've got one, uh, one discipline such as healthcare that's really having an opportunity to collaborate and grow, what are the ancillary things that feed that that we might also make part of that collaboration in a way that local entrepreneurs who might sometimes be overlooked uh, because uh, you're reaching far away. I know that there are many times uh, one of my largest clients is one of the largest hospital groups in the country and I'll be in another part of the nation doing training for them and I'll ask myself, are they sure there isn't someone in this community could do that? And I would really rather partner with them and help that person do it than constantly make those trips with my team to do it. So I think this is a question that Jackie could have chamber implications. What are the opportunities in an ancillary way for other less visible opportunities for entrepreneurs be part of this whole collaboration? I'd like to take a stab at that. Um, there are a number of activities where people can get involved. First, I could tell you, because I do travel quite heavily and I go to New York a lot, there's a lot of interest in the venture capital and the angel capital world to fund things like this. 
Uh, but there are even on the government side, there are grants now, the National Institute of Health, the, uh, the Agency for Health Research and Quality there. I would recommend that people interested in this look at some of the government grants that are there and look and see what the grant language is asking for. Uh, for example, the National Institute of Health has a grant called an SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research. And those grants will allow you to be a for-profit and apply and have a sustainable business plan. Some of the other things you were talking about, I think it goes back to what was said before by Jonathan, and is if you have a structure that these technological innovators can plug into, rather than all inventing silos of new ideas, you, because it's, it's an overwhelm, there's so many good ideas out there, and there's an overwhelming amount of, of point solutions. But if you have an infrastructure somewhere in the middle that they could plug into, then you have, to me, you have the best of both worlds. You have the, the free market able to choose the best and the worst based on what, you know, what, what the need is, but at the same time, you have a standard glue. Everybody buys the same Elmer's glue and it all fits in, so. Good question, Jonathan. There's a really good example of that, just to uh, demonstrate that the community is doing it. That's not to say we shouldn't do it more, but there's a, um, um, an Apple phone app developer in Sarasota County that partnered with Sarasota Memorial Hospital that used the hospital as a pilot project for his app. It's basically integrating all the providers and that, that product is, is soaring. So Sarasota Memorial Hospital is yes. doing that. Yes. Uh, I just want to uh, caution also that many times we're looking at our local institutions to develop the necessary healthcare professionals that we have. But, but there are a lot of areas that we don't have the depth of the expertise here, like mentioned PT and OT. And uh, we now know that the PT and OT professions now have to be doctor trained in order to be in the community. And that takes a lot of expense. The, the caution is, is that what we should be doing too, if we want to keep these people here, OTs and PTs, developing sort of a category or catalog of programs that are offered nationally online that they can, they can stay here and receive their, their doctorate PT or OT program. And there are many of them that so we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. So I think we have to be kind of more open and going beyond the community and develop this kind of, kind of inventory of other colleges and universities that offer that. I say that because I teach in one online that, that is a, 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 a P. You're ready for the networking time. You're just a few minutes away. There's another quick, a quick thing too is that what you were just saying, the workforce has been very, very helpful to us. We're developing a software program with the Pines of uh, Sarasota being funded by the workforce on looking at a, an inductive approach of looking at, uh, looking at change that a person is experiencing and try to relate those to the adverse drug reactions that are associated with medications as opposed to looking at medications and trying to look at the adverse and go back an inductive approach. So yes, there are a lot of entrepreneurs doing that. We're one of them. The workforce has been very, very grateful in, help, in helping us developing that and we're testing it right now at the Pines. I'd like to ask each one of our panelists, I want you to think about if you had 10 seconds to challenge this group, to ask this group to do anything in regard to what we've talked about today, think about it for a moment, what would you ask? If you had 10 seconds for your voice to be heard by your colleagues and everyone in this room with something you hope people would do as a result of today, think about what that would be for just a moment. One of the questions that came in was what voids do you think there are in critical leadership competencies for healthcare professionals, and are those voids being identified? And I think we've done that. I think we've heard that in several cases. It oftentimes is the relational skills, the people skills. Uh, the clinical skills, oftentimes the patient outcomes, the patient satisfaction scores, can be rooted in the relationships. And I think that's something we heard today that's being done quite well. So think about what your statement would be. If you had 10 seconds to say to this group that's here today, this is what I hope you will do as a result of what we've all done today. And, uh, we're going to start right over here, if you would. You'll take the mic, and you've got just 10 seconds. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've learned today that there's, there are a lot of good things going on, but one piece that I think um, didn't really get talked about, and the gentleman, um, he left, but he asked a question that alluded to this. One of the um, key elements in the education and preparing the future workforce and the future people to go into this training is parents. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Research shows that children by grade three have started to formulate ideas about what they want to be when they grow up. I know we don't know what we want to be when we grow up, but they do. And it's based on what they see going on around them. 
but Thank the you. parents are the key ingredient Thank you. to getting a good workforce. Good, good point. Thank you. I'll, I'll nudge and give you 15 seconds. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I think, that, I think the main idea would just be to, to keep in mind the, the people that came together to form this collaboration and that what it took was a lot of brainstorming. It took a lot of involvement on, on everyone's part and that it shouldn't stop here, that your involvement, uh, whether it's at no matter what level it is, whether you're, you know, targeting your senators and your congressmen to do things that are important, uh, getting things that are going to be helpful towards the community so that we don't have that isolationism that, you know, this one's doing this, so we're right. not going to do it. All of us come from very right. different paths, and we all join together, and I think that's something Good. to bring back to the community. Good. Thank you. Let's keep going. I think about all I can do is echo what Kathy just said because she stole my thunder, but I think that's it. I think we need to educate our community, yes. stay connected, keep the lines of communication open, and uh, educate our legislators. Thank you. Next. Um, if I had to <clears throat> keep it to 10 seconds, I would say fully inform yourselves as a community, network, collaborate, and then try to spread the word relative to that. This is a unique opportunity. I, you know, I've lived through at least three declines in the economy in my professional career, and health care is really recession proof. We, we see an upswing in interest and applications to all the health professions, and I'll challenge anyone to disagree with me on that. When the economy goes south, the interest in, in health professions go up. So we're in a unique situation, and we have a unique opportunity. Thank you. That was 15. Um, I think Mark Twain probably said it best. He said, when, when you're green, you're growing. When you ripe, you rot. And I think each and every one of you should, I challenge each and every one of you, and as a community, that the students that are out there need our support. It's not about all of us sitting here. It's about finding that resource, directing it, and channeling it, and then supporting it. Jackie. One would be have uh, information on wellness programs that are available to local businesses, please funnel them through the Manatee Chamber. We are currently working to compile a list of wellness programs that are available to businesses, particularly those smaller businesses that aren't the large employers that need to just know, what can I do if I have $100 an employee? So please funnel those through me, number one. Number two, particularly for those of you in Manatee County, consider joining the Manatee Healthcare Alliance as a founding member. Yes. I, I think just because... Uh, you, you are all here, you're paying attention, and you care. And, and I would say to keep paying attention, keep caring, encourage other community members to do the same. Ask those good questions that have been asked and, and give that um, important critical feedback um, that we need to hear so um, we can make a difference and influence change. So thank you for being here. Thank you, yes, next. Um, I'm gonna echo Mike. No, please, it's on, go ahead, go ahead, it's on. I can use two and you can really hear me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to challenge you to take personal responsibility, to continue taking care of yourself from a health perspective, to set the example, to use the resources that we have in our community like the Suncoast Workforce Board and Career Edge, and to stay connected and lobby for our interests as a community. Very good point. Next. I'm a firm believer that the most challenging situations often cause the most innovative responses. And I think we are really at that cross section in our, our uh, history. And I agree, I'm, I see someone saying, I hope so, I hope so too. But I think the response today, the level of interest, Jonathan's point is the train has left the station. So we have to be very smart, not only about getting on that train, but I am a firm believer in the opportunity we have because the collaboration and the recognition that none of us alone can do this, and that includes you in the community, and that is to create the culture of wellness in this community. To the extent, Bob is right, I, I believe, to the extent that we can really transform the community's values around wellness and commitment to that personally and as a culture, we will be way ahead of what needs to be done. I would, uh, I would say very strongly is help us figure out, help, help figure out a way to get the message of the opportunities that are out there to market the opportunities in health 
and technology, that intersection, how to market that to the youth, help us figure out a way to get that message across that there are new jobs, there's a new horizon, there are new opportunities, and they're right there, and just help us get that word out, and that'll help get the interest up. Thank you. I'm going to piggyback on the theme of employee wellness, um, but be specific. I would challenge this community within one year from today that this panel be replaced by six entities that represent the largest employers in our counties. Manatee County Government, Sarasota County Government, Manatee County School District, the Sarasota County School District, HCA Hospitals, and Sarasota Memorial Hospitals. They're the largest self-funded health plans in our area. They're the largest employers in our area. Those organizations need to be sitting up here and being the models for what employee wellness is all about, all about prevention. Because if you get that culture into the employers, start in the school districts, go to the counties, go to the hospitals, it's like, it's like an app going viral on the internet. I mean, it, it, will, it, will, it will pollinate throughout the community. Well. So I challenge that that happens Thank one you. year from today. Thank you. I would encourage everyone to not walk out of here and forget about the needs of adult day mental health services. It is grossly overlooked, totally underfunded, and it is the 800 pound gorilla of health care costs. And it also is the 800 pound gorilla towards legal incarcerations and other issues. It extends way beyond what anybody thinks because one in four have some form of mental illness. Do not ignore it. Treat it early on. It can be done out in the community very cost effectively and would go a long way towards freeing up other resources. Oh, and last but not least, if anybody here thinks the government's going to take care of us, you're crazy. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, I'm going to piggyback on wellness as well. I think that as I grow older, I want to make sure that that workforce that's coming out there to take care of me will be healthier than the workforce that's currently in place. Uh, we see way too much of our nursing staff that is really so compassionate about caring for everyone else but themselves. And we really need to not only, I think it goes back to mental health, it's incremental changes. If we've behaved this way and we are who we are, it's going to take a lot more than just exercise and eating right to make us where we need to go. I think the other piece is technology is wonderful. However, the human touch really does make a huge difference in how we're going to take care of the rest of um, the population. Thank and I think work-life balance has to be a high priority in how we care for each other. Thank you. Dr. Bensey. I think focusing on our youth um, and exemplifying uh, the, uh, the, the needs there that, uh, that they need to, uh, to learn from us in terms of tobacco use. I, I applaud the hospitals, the schools. They've already stopped it. On the, uh, in, do that in your agencies. The physical activity, we live in a beautiful community. Uh, utilize, realize Bradenton. Utilize the Sarasota Trails. Get involved with rowing. Uh, nutrition, uh, support the, the restaurants. Support the, um, the farmer's markets that are trying to make us healthier and really focus on our kids. We don't need the teen pregnancies, the economics, the, the demographics of our community demonstrate the health of our community. Yes, so put that emphasis on the next generation and let's make sure that they don't have to have these discussions yes, in the future. Thank you. The one thing that's been evident to me today is how much all of these people sitting here are interconnected. I was a 25-year-old businessman in Baltimore when I was invited to a breakfast meeting at the Miller Brothers restaurant at the Hilton Hotel the young Mayor William Donald Schaefer had gathered a group of young businessmen, older businessmen, people from city agencies, et cetera. And I'll never forget what he said that day. He said, we have to change our city. And he said, I can't do it. And he pointed to different people. He said, none of them can do it, but we can do it. And that, that day began the Inner Harbor Initiative. And what a tremendous experience that was for me over a decade to watch a city transform itself. And at the same time, to go back today and watch how much it's reverted back to the tragedy it once was. This really is our moment in time. There aren't any guarantees. We've seen demonstrated to us today the power of Sarasota Manatee, the power of the Bi-County Health Committee, and the power of the Workforce Board, Career Edge, and Collaboration. And as has been so appropriately said by our panelists, when we leave here, we are still very much connected. And 
It won't be possible for any one entity to accomplish this. And here's the part we can't forget. If we don't all succeed, we all fail. It didn't take a hurricane, didn't take a tornado, didn't take an earthquake, thankfully. But there's a unity here that we just can't let slip by. Rune and her team have done a fabulous job, and you got us right to 5 o'clock straight up. Good work. And let's thank our participants here. Now, just, just, before, we, just before we move into our networking time, uh, a, a lady whom I hold as a dear friend and a visionary, and I learned a great deal from, and she's our CEO of the Workforce Board, Mary Helen Chris. Mary. Thank you, Barry. You know, if I said simply thank you for your attendance, that would be the biggest understatement of the year. I mean, this is truly a celebration, a celebration of the accomplishments of the Bi-County Healthcare Committee. And this all started with a grant. Leslie Lovelace, thank you for bringing us that grant. Um, and we found Jennifer Benzie at a Manatee Chamber of Commerce event. But um, all of the members of the uh, of the Alliance. Would you please stand so we can see? I know we have some in the audience that are on the um, I County Health Care Alliance. So would you all please stand? Brian Murphy, I know you're on it. Okay, all right, please, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And for our panelists, we need to give them a great big round of applause. You did a wonderful job. Wonderful job. You know, I once heard a professor speak about the fine art of discontent, and that has stayed with me. I think I was 22 when I heard that, but that has always stayed with me. If we were contented, then nothing would have ever happened in this world. But, so we know that we have much more to do. We're not contented yet. I heard that from all of you. We still have to do more. I can tell you that the Suncoast Workforce is committed to doing everything we can to help that. Uh, Leslie's looking for more grants right now. I can t see her brain turning. But uh, thank you all so very, very much. I mean, like I said, the understatement is thank you. It's a celebration of all your accomplishments, and we do appreciate it. all of your hard work, all the hours and dedication that you've given us. Thanks again. Thank you, Mary Ellen, very much. And I know our participants would want to thank you. You've been a tremendous audience, so let's thank them for the great questions and great interactions. Wonderful. And so now it's time for our networking and our refreshment time to continue the discussion that we've heard here. Thank you very much.